Thank you for the introduction. So, in the next 25 minutes, I will uh, discuss the role of image guided intervention in uh, patients with prostate cancer. Uh, so, the learning objectives of my presentation are to show the potential of image guided focal therapies in patients with prostate cancer and to illustrate this from a clinical perspective. So why image guided interventions? I think it's more general. It's a minimal invasive. Uh, you preserve the body integrity and we have less side effects. Um, it has also a real economic impact because uh, short recovery time as by the previous speaker, ambulatory patient care, patient stays within social environment. And I think that's very important. And also a lot of investments are being made by the uh, big companies and um, there's really a push also from the companies to implement these new techniques and new innovations in our clinical routine. The downside of that is that sometimes uh, technology is really pushed and that sometimes the technology is not that innovative and then we use it wrongly. It also allows to uh, combine strategies, uh, think about combining uh, ablation with immunotherapy, uh, we can develop new focal therapies and also combine it with new target therapies. So most of, our, of my work is based on MR-guided interventions. Um, the pros are it has excellence of tissue contrast. You can see what you're doing, especially in prostate. You can uh, see the prostate. If you have a CT image, it's much more difficult to define the lesion within, the, CT, within a, the prostate. And we're also able to localize the tumor more accurately with a multi MRI. We're also able to target probes. You can do it with an RFA needle, uh, laser fiber, HIFU, uh, whatever you have available in your hospital. And we're also able to monitor it real time. And that's, I think, really the selling point of MR. You can measure temperature differences during the ablation. And we don't use any x-rays. This is a kidney case. Um, this is a cryoablation. You can nicely visualize a tumor, for example, in this area, a uh, small renal mass two cryonials, MR-guided insertion, and you can actually appreciate the signal void of the ice ball. And after three months, you can actually appreciate the, ice, um, the uh, cryo effect within that lesion. We can also perform real-time temperature mapping as an example of a focal laser ablation, uh, laser fibers inserted in the prostate, and you require every two seconds uh, in three planes the uh, a temperature of a phase image, and based on that, you can uh, define the temperature differences. Uh, the downside of MR, uh, limited workspace, uh, open versus closed MR uh, systems. You need MR compatible equipment and also there's always a discussion about costs. Um, but I think if you have a, if you look at from a, a business point of view, I think we still have a case because a lot of, if you compare, for example, focal prostate um, treatment with open or radical treatment, I think it was still on the uh, economic, uh, uh, good economic side of the uh, of the uh, ba uh, the balance. So there's a nice image of of um, Ganji because you have to work within the center of the uh, MRI bore. Um, that can be quite difficult, especially if you do it visually. You have to put in a needle. And you want to use real time imaging of the needle um, if you, if during the advancement of the needle. Um, as a cryo uh, prostate uh, case. Again, the center of the prostate, the center of the magnet, it can be quite difficult to reach. So what are kind of MRI image guided intervention in prostate? Um, most commonly we do biopsies, either within the MRI bore using the MRI itself, or put the MRI into the ultrasound machine and fuse the MRI images with the ultrasound and then perform the biopsy. Um, we also certain developments in using robotics in steering the needle into the area of interest. But for today, I will focus on, on thermal therapy, and mainly on MR-guided um, focus ultrasound, laser ablation, and cryoablation. So for today, prostate cancer, I mainly focus on focal therapy because we can, of course, ablate the entire gland, but um, the benefit of using imaging to guide our probes uh, makes gives the opportunity to just focus on the lesion and then uh, try to eradicate that lesion. Bless you. <laughs> Image guided ablations uh, provide a mineral uh, invasive approach to prostate cancer therapy and is also getting more and more acceptance. Um, if you look in the neurology society, more and more neurologists are also performing uh, high foo, for example, for prostate cancer and a focal high foo. 
So focotherapy is an immersion treatment modality uh, for patients with localized prostate cancer. And the aim is to reduce the morbidity seen with radical treatments and maintaining cancer control. So what are the current needs actually? So we also know that um, based on, on literature that in around 50% of the cases, patients undergo, for example, radical prostatectomy, and 50% of those patients will not benefit from this uh, treatment. They will not die from the disease, but um, they will have no benefit of that uh, intervention. So what we need to do is to accurately identify those patients with this insignificant disease and delay the radical treatment as long as possible. An imaging can play a role, I think, uh, especially with MPMRI, we can accurately identify those patients. And if we want to implement new technologies and new innovations and new treatment modalities, uh, we need to have better outcome. So if, if you look at quality of life, sexual, urinary, and erectile dysfunction are very important for the patient. And also cost effectiveness, because our uh, healthcare costs are increasing and increasing over time. And we need outcome studies that if we do these kind of new treatments, that we also have uh, economic benefit. Um, so the current treatment paradigm is either doing nothing, active surveillance, and surveil the patients, or at the other end of the spectrum, uh, treat the prostate radically, either by radiotherapy or uh, radical prostatectomy. Uh, reported urinary incontinence is around 5 to 20%. Erectile dysfunction reported up to 70%. And also about the toxicity reported uh, around 5 to 10% depending on which technique you use. So if we want to do focal treatment in prostate cancer, we have to meet certain uh, requirements before you can do these kind of treatments. You need a diagnostic test, which can show you the, the lesion within the prostate. You need high quality imaging. And also if you see where the lesion is, you need uh, guiding systems or guiding tools to get the probe towards the area of interest. And if you want to do this kind of treatments within the MRI system, you need also real-time monitoring of the, of the needle inside the patient or monitor the temperature differences during time. And for that, after the ablation, um, you have to be able to assess the extent of the ablation and also the totality. And that's ac actually the, um, the requirements before we can do these kind of treatments. Um, however, uh, also some hurdles in our... Uh, journey to focal therapy. And the first one is, of course, the multifocality of the disease. Up to 80% of the patients have multifocal tumors within the prostate. Um, also in breast cancer, this phenomenon is seen. So if you, if you believe in the index theory, so if you have multiple lesions within the prostate, there's one lesion which will um, cause the metastasis so if we can find this index lesion and kill this index lesion, most likely we can um, leave the other Gleason cyst cancers without any treatment. A cure shift MPMRI, we already discussed that yesterday during um, uh, the talks about detection of cancer. Uh, I think the negative predictive value is quite high, around 95%. Also depends, of course, where you do the um, MRI of the prostate. Uh, but I think Currently, we can nicely and accurately find the lesion within the prostate. The other thing which can be uh, uh, an issue is the histological volume. It can be quite difficult to assess the totality of the lesion within the prostate. So, if you use an anatomical T2 image, you have a both under and overestimation of the tumor volume. It's quite unreliable. Um, in my opinion, also based on literature, uh, if you use the fusion combined with T2, you have the best correlation between the MR and the histological tumor volume uh, to define the actual tumor lesion. However, because there's an uncertainty, uh, several uh, authors have looked at how, how is your correlation between what I see in MR and the tumor volume and compared it with histopathology. And the group from, from NYU showed that if you have a 9 millimeter treatment margin around a visible lesion, then you can be quite sure that you have treated an entire lesion. But I'm not sure if you know how, what the size of a prostate. The prostate size is around 4 to, by 4 by 4 centimeters. Uh, so if you have a 1 centimeter margin around the entire prostate, then we're talking about a hemiablation. 
Um, separation of significant and non significant tumors already discussed. Um, and the problem is, if we want to treat focally, uh, I'm not sure if we should uh, treat Gleason 6 because most likely Gleason 6 cancers the patient will not die from. The problem is the, the, the patients with a Gleason 7, 4 plus 3 or 3 plus 4, I think those patients will be eligible for uh, focal treatment. But the problem is if you want to define significant versus insignificant, if you look at the definition, um, every institution uses a different definition for a clinical significant. And also pathology, if you look at pathology reports and, and at the biopsy results, in 40% of the cases, the patient gets a radical prostatectomy, it's upstaged to a higher gleason grade. So there's still room for improvement. Um, so focal th therapy already mentioned, and most likely you will treat a specific lobe and not just one, one target area, because I don't believe that if you do just one target area that you will treat the entire lesion. Um, I think with the energy source we have now available, we are also able to actually shape the ablation zone uh, with, without any significant effect on the surrounding tissue. And if we do these kind of focal treatments, we have to be minimally invasive and have a low per and post-operative complication rate because we have to compete with other uh, techniques. So I mentioned before, I'm not sure if I believe in these kind of approaches. I think we're more going to a hemiablation. Uh, zonal ablation or hypoxic ablation is a really huge ablation. Uh, I'm also not so convinced that we will uh, we have to treat all the lesions. I think we, th we have to treat the index lesion, and that's the most important one. So what are, what are the techniques available uh, for now? It's so laser ablation, uh, cryoablation, high foo, phototherapy, IRE, focal radiotherapy, high dose radiotherapy. A lot of options are available. And if you talk to patients, they don't know what to choose because there are so many options. And there's a group who wants to get rid of the cancer, so they go for radical, they go for radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy. But there's also, I think, a large group, and especially at the age of 50 to 60, males who want to preserve their erectile function and they really pursue focal therapy. They're really pushing the urologist uh, or radiation oncologist towards focal therapy. So a lot of these techniques are really patient driven. So I see a lot of patients who prefer the focal treatment because if we do focal treatment we can still prolong the radical prostatectomy or uh, radical uh, radiotherapy for a couple of years. So, um, cryoablation. So, currently, most of the cryoablations are performed on a truss guidance. So, you stick in the anorotal probe into the rectum, you stick in the needles, and you turn on the ice machine. Uh, but the problem is, you can nicely see the, uh, the ice front, so the rectal wall uh, is nicely visible, but what happens beyond the ice front is not visible. Um, also, a lot of complications have been reported using this approach. Um, Using MRI guidance, you have a 3D volume, you can nicely appreciate the, the soft tissue contrast. And also during time, during the, the cryoablation, you can follow the ice ball during time. And you can also see if the ice ball is growing too large. If it's too large, you can stop the ice machine and the ice ball will grow a little bit further. But after one minute, it will stop, uh, will stop growing. So when do we do these kind of procedures? Um, in our institution, we do these kind of procedures after uh, uh, after previous therapy. Most of the cases in our institution have already had a way of therapy, either external or brachytherapy. Uh, this procedure is done under the anesthesia. Uh, we use a transperineal approach. Uh, we use a certain leg holder, which gives us the opportunity opportunity to use this grid here. And using this grid, you can target uh, the, the cancer uh, within the prostate. We use both a rectal warmer and a urethral warmer because this provides, uh, this prevents the rectal wall from uh, freezing. We use warm water, and also the, uh, the urethral warmer is necessary because you don't want to have any strictures within your uh, prostate. And when we do the uh, cryonial placements, always on real-time monitoring. So during the intervention, we stick a needle. And based on the imaging in three planes, you advance the needle, and the needle is being tracked, and you can put the needle uh, on the position within the lesion. Um, because we use an MR, we have only three, uh, three possible needles which can be used. With a new uh, generation, you have much more possibilities. Um, of course, it's nice. The, the company always provides you with certain uh, 
temperature maps based on, on phantoms, uh, but in real life it's always a little bit different. So what we did, we looked at the, uh, this is a cryoablation of uh, the peripheral zone, and if you look closely there's a very high signal intensity rim around the ablation. And we looked in phantoms, what does this high signal intensity rim represent? Because we know if, if it's minus 40 degrees Celsius, you can be quite sure that all the cells are being killed. Uh, between minus 20 and minus 40, you're not certain, but if you do a second cycle or a third cycle, you can be also quite sure that below minus 20, all the cells will be killed. Um, what we found is that if you use this kind of t one weighted sequence, very simple, very fast, this signal, uh, high signal intensity, represents the zero degree Celsius uh, border. So that's also important information because everything below zero, especially if you go to the rectum, it may be harmed. So that's why we use these kind of imaging techniques. If it's just um, um, going through the rectal wall, we lower the percentage of the gas going through the needle. In this way, we, we try to prevent the freezing of the rectal wall. Always test the cry needles, of course. And there's an example real time. And you can actually appreciate the, uh, the beam-like structure. I think the, those are two needles. This is the lesion in the uh, right peripheral zone and transition zone. It's a recurrent lesion after radiotherapy. And you can actually see that's completely covered by the ice pool. This is a ureter warmer. At the beginning, we didn't use any rectal warmers. So we naturally also appreciate the fat playing between the rectum and the, and the ice ball. So a, I can be quite sure that we didn't hit the rectal wall in this case. Um, some information from other studies. Um, in this pa patient group, patient underwent a focal cryotherapy as, as, newly, as, as a therapy where they in newly diagnosed prostate cancer. 48 patients underwent uh, post cryotherapy biopsy. 46 were negative, still 25 were positive. And that's what you see in a lot of focal therapy literature. Because if you do treat only one lesion, for example, on the left side, and at the biopsy, random biopsy, you find something on the left side, it's either Gleason 6, which is quite often the case. So you have a positive result, but it's not actually reflecting the result of therapy. And you also have, for example, that you're incomplete. And therefore, you always, if you do a, these kind of ablations, if you take the biopsies, please take them at the rim of the ablation because that's the location you will find the positive cells. If you do it in the center, you'll most likely will find necrotic tissue. But if you look at the side of the rim of the ablation, that's the location where you have to find the, uh, the recurrent or residual disease location. Uh, from our uh, patient group, uh, we treated so far 110 patients. Uh, we found that the quality of life uh, went down a little bit, uh, but didn't go uh, down significantly. So, of course, we, if we do ablation, it will have some impact on, on, on uh, for example, on the potency or at the uh, contents level, uh, but still the quality of life was rated um, uh, similar as before the ablation. Um, very high PSA nowadays. I think the cutoff is more than around 10 to 15. Uh, if it's above 10, we always do a PSMA scan to be sure that we don't have any positive lymph nodes um, within, the, uh, within the pelvic uh, region. Uh, so this PSA was 23. After cryoablation went down to 0.2. Actually, that's a very good result. If it's below 1, I'm always very happy. Um, this is the, uh, the lesion. Diffusion shows um, impeded diffusion and contrast enhancement is very helpful. This after ablation, uh, still after this was one of my first patients, the PSA is still around 0 0.2. It's not always a success story. Uh, like in this case, a very young uh, young patient, in my opinion, six years old, underwent uh, ray therapy when he was 52. And he had a local recurrence at the base of the prostate and was invading into the seminal vesicles. And uh, you can nicely see the brachytherapy seat here. Uh, PSA was uh, four at the time we did the cryoablation. And after three months, PSA was less than 0 0.1. I thought that's a very good result because less than 0 0.1, then most likely after one or two years, it will be still uh, below one. But after six months, PSA went up directly very, uh, very fast up to, six, to, to three. And then if you look closely, there's still some enhancement here visible in the uh, seminal vesicles. So, we hit the lesion, but there was still some microscopic uh, tissue which we didn't hit. 
and we found a lesion 10 after cryoablation. <coughs> so we re ablated this lesion, and the patient is, um, has a PSA now from a, went down to again 0 0.2 and is now around 1.2. Um, the reason of doing these kinds of treatments in this patient group is that we try to prolong the hormonal therapy as long as possible because that's actually already radical prostatectomy, but that's quite difficult in these kind of uh, patients after radiotherapy. So this is more a kind of niche where you can try to prolong the hormonal therapy as long as possible. Laser ablation, um, it's getting more and more interesting. It's a very old technique, of course, but in prostate, uh, I think it's now introduced, I think, six or seven years ago. Uh, laser fiber is induced into the lesion again. You can uh, turn on the laser light and you can actually uh, ablate the lesion. It's a very fast technique. Um, now I do uh, ablation two minutes per uh, per ablation, so two minutes turn on the machine, ablate for two minutes. It takes around one and a half hours to uh, ablate these uh, these lesions. Most likely, um, it's a lesion at one side of the prostate. I don't do lesions throughout throughout the entire prostate. If it's a localized small lesion, uh, then you have an indication for doing these kind of treatments. Uh, these patients are. Um, uh, de novo disease, so they are newly diagnosed cancer. If you have a 3 plus 4, 4 plus 3, then you're eligible for these kind of treatments. Uh, you have a very sharp transition zone, so what you see on your temperature image is also what you get. So if you don't want to ablate the rectal wall, you will do it if your temperature doesn't increase at the rectal wall. So it's very, very precise. It says a transition zone around, around 1 to 2 millimeters. If you compare it with cryo or RFA, it's around 5 to 10, meter, 10 millimeters between what is healthy tissue, uh, what's treated, and what's killed. And that's, uh, I think, a very uh, a plus for these kind of techniques. Uh, it's a minimal invasive setting. Uh, these kind of treatments are being done under local anesthesia. Patient comes in in the morning, uh, we do the ablation, and leaves the uh, hospital in the afternoon. Uh, of course, you need some uh, side conditions, so you need temperature mapping on your machine. Uh, you need a localizing system to stick in the fiber. And you also have, need access to the MR scanner and that can be quite cumbersome if your other colleagues want to do four uh, knees in an hour. So that's always a discussion you can have at in your institution. Once again, it's a sharp transition zone between the ablation and another bladed zone. But with a lot of techniques, uh, they are introduced into uh, our practice. Um, and I always want to see if I do an ablation, is the ablation effective? And that's, I think, very important. Are all the cells within the ablation zone dead? And this is a nice paper from Toronto in which they looked at the um, ablation, the laser ablation in, in uh, prostates. I think it was in beagles. And they correlated the, uh, the, the ablation zone with the hepatology. And what they found, they didn't find any viable cells within the uh, treated uh, area. And that's, I think, very important. The example in uh, almost an hemiablation in transition zone, you can actually see these needle sticks here. Use the ablation and the temperature mapping during the ablation, and this way you can uh, nicely uh, do the ablation itself. Uh, four years ago, um, when I was at NYU, I helped with the uh, first uh, patient group doing these kind of laser ablations, and we include 25 patients. Uh, two of them had residual uh, disease after the ablation and were reablated. Uh, but if you look at the functional outcome, there was no difference between the baseline and the post-operative uh, ablation. A new technology, which you will also, I think in the US, it, it was FDA approved two years ago. In, in Europe, it's already there for a longer time using HIFU. There are two ways, either trans, uh, transuretral, so you stick in the device in the urethra. Um, this is the, uh, the window of the HIFU elements. And the high fuel elements are rotated within the urethra, and this way you can uh, dissipate the energy within the prostate. And using a temperature feedback, so if you, for example, I want, don't want to cross this border, if the software detects the temperature is above a certain degree Celsius, it stops the machine and it rotates further. So in this way, you have real time feedback of your ablation, and then you can also shape your ablation. It's a very elegant technique, and also very, also very fast. To treat entire prostate, it takes around 45 minutes, but if you do a focal therapy, I think in 15 to 20 minutes, you have done an ablation. So it's a very promising technique. Technique. The other technique is the transrectal approach. Of course, it's not MR compatible, 
uh, you, stay, you put in the um, uh, transducer into the rectum, you have degas water which is circulating around the, um, the applicator here, and then you put the energy into the prostate. As an example for a patient, 61 year old male, Gleason 6, because that's a trial patient, Gleason 6 and 7 uh, cans are being included, PSA of 9.3, this lesion visible here in the right peripheral zone of the mid prostate shows some enhancement and perhaps some high skin intensity, but mainly the, this is convincing together with the, uh, with the MR target biopsy results. So this is the image of the uh, transducer into, inserted into the vitra. It's a very rigid uh, device, but it's also very, quite easy to insert. Uh, so what we do, we insert a Foley catheter, open end, put in a guide wire, and over the guide wire we introduce the, uh, the system. And it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite smooth. This is the... Um, uh, it's under general anesthesia, so don't worry. <laughs> this is the, uh, the window and it rotates. So that's what we see on our uh, screen. Uh, you can uh, annotate the prostate. And based on that, the temperature image is being uh, generated. You turn on the IFU system and then it rotates and you get your, your feedback. This is the after ablation. You can actually see, because this is a whole gland approach, you can actually see the, uh, the ablation zone. And after three months, PSA is 0 0.13. And oh, there's a typo. And the, the volume of the prostate is decreasing in size. And I think in one year, there will be hardly any tissue left. And what about the Urethra, that's still, um, um, so what we do in this approach, I didn't uh, tell that, is that we put in a suprapubic catheter, uh, we put a Foley into the prostate, into the urethra, and after two weeks a patient uh, can avoid. So there are no strictures described yet. Um, the other thing is the, um, the high flow system itself, the, the stick has some water cooling, so you prevent uh, the heat to dissipate into the urethra tissue itself. So if the lesion is up to three is within three millimeter from the, the probe, you cannot do the ablation because it's too close. So to conclude, um, MRI guided procedures uh, are possible. Uh, it's a very interesting and evolving field. Um, you can do focal target therapies in prostate cancer. Uh, however, uh, we have to be careful to put it out there in our clinical routine because we need more evidence. All the evidence we've got from the radiotherapy therapy and radical prostatectomy, we have outcomes of 20 to 30 years. And with these kind of treatments, of course, it's difficult to catch up. Uh, we have to think about smarter ways. I'm not sure if we have to do randomized control trials, but I think there are also other ways to prove that these kind of techniques may be helpful for, for, may be helpful for the patient. And with that, I want to thank you for attention.